So first I just want to say, you know, we're talking about brain health and aging. You can't think about memory. So I just want to say I'm so glad that you all remembered to come this evening. So that's the first step. Um, so today's presentation, this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about all of the research that's come out in the past 10 years or so that has shown us the factors that affect aging, the factors that can prevent memory loss and maximize our memory ability. We are literally spending billions of dollars trying to find a pill to prevent memory loss, and nothing has even come close. And we thought there, there was actually one clinical trial that we were all holding out hope on, and it was to catch Alzheimer's at a very, very early stage and break down some proteins, and the results were just in last week. It didn't work. So, you know, we, so we were kind of coming, we thought we were coming close. Um, so we don't have a pill yet, but I don't think it's all that disappointing because when you look at this research, we have the answer. And so that's kind of the, uh, the thesis idea here. We're going to take a very holistic approach and look at a lot of different factors that have been documented to be associated with memory changes in older adulthood. And it's not all about older adulthood. This stuff is true in middle adulthood, and some of these factors might even be true in young adulthood. Um, so we can talk about that. But I want your help. What do you think these factors are? Besides age, what do you think determines a good memory ability in older adulthood? What's one of the factors? Just, just shout it out. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the use it or lose it scenario. Use it or lose it. So cognitive stimulation, doing what we're doing here right now. Cognitive stimulation accounts for about 15% of how much our memory changes in older adulthood, according to a study just published in the journal Neurology. So cognitive stimulation. What else? Physical activity. Physical activity, you're absolutely right. It's the most and best studied factor. The National Institutes of Health said physical activity is the one we're most sure about. And check this out. We know what types of physical exercise. We know the best times of day. We even know how often you need to do them to maximize physical uh, or to maximize memory ability in older adulthood. So we've got this one figured out. You know what the hard part is though? getting people to exercise. And that's actually kind of my, my secret motive in doing this presentation. It's just to kind of motivate people to get this information out there. I think that's one of the best ways to motivate people is to tell them the benefits of doing something. So physical exercise is a big one and we're gonna talk about that in our time together. What else? Social interaction. Social interaction, social engagement, that does matter. It's very difficult to study and actually for about 10 years ago, there was very few studies, but then there's a researcher, Lisa Berkman at Harvard University. She has definitively shown the most socially engaged older adults, maybe middle-aged adults as well, are the least likely to develop memory problems. The interesting thing about her findings was a very robust little sub-finding. They found that people with the least formal education benefited the most. And we keep finding this effect. We find it in cognitive stimulation too. People that have an associate degree or only a high school degree, the most socially engaged look like they have a master's degree in terms of their chance of developing dementia. So, and that's another factor related to use it or lose it. This is good news for the college students here. For every year of education beyond high school, you are 7% less likely to develop dementia. I recently told that to our provost, and he's thinking about charging a dementia reduction <laughs> student fee next year. No, actually, I made that up. But, um, but that's, that's kind of interesting, that you can get the benefits of, say, six years of education if you're the most socially engaged, because that's what social engagement is in part, you know, is to continue learning, to be open, to be flexible, the things that we need to do uh, to have a healthy mind. Good. What else? Diet, yeah. Now the diet one, there is research out and we're going to talk about it, but it's the messiest. And just when I think we have a factor figured out, then another study comes along. Have you ever heard of the cliche, the more you learn, the more you realize how little you actually know? Oh, yes. You know, and I feel like that's more true for physical exercise and brain health than any other factor. But we know omega-3 fatty acids have a strong correlation with dementia and memory ability, so we'll talk about that research, maybe even quickly why that happens. Um, and then the other ones are, are less powerful, but antioxidants prevent damage to your cells, 
And then the big one is we need to avoid diabetes, prediabetes, insulin resistant. So even a little bit of insulin resistance is associated with decrease in attention and concentration. So diet, certainly important. You guys are doing a great job giving this lecture. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, no, any other factors? Genetics, yeah. You just won the greatest amount of variance explained award. Genetics. Turns out 50% of your memory ability, 50% of your chance of developing dementia, 50% of how intelligent you are, actually even 50% of how happy you are is determined by how well you chose your parents. That's depressing, isn't it? Yeah, let, let's, we'll come back to that one in a minute. Let me wrap up the, the genetics. So the genetics is 50%. We can't do anything about it. They're trying to turn genes off, or genes make proteins, and they've actually introduced enzymes into the brain that break up the proteins that the suspect genes um, are making, and nothing has worked yet. So we're going to have to focus on the other 50%, and that's what we've been talking about. Cardiovascular risk, risk factors always matter. You know why? At the very least... What's the most common type of dementia? Uh, stroke related. Number two. Oh. Most common is Alzheimer's. Number two is, is vascular dementia. Vascular dementia caused by a stroke is the second most common. So we have to control high blood pressure. We have to control cholesterol. We have to control the hardening of the arteries. We need to have good uh, heart health if we want to have good brain health. Um, and the heart health research is, always seems to be 20 or 25 years ahead of brain health research. I bet a lot of you in here have known for many years that aerobic training and strength training is good for your heart. We were, took us 20 years to figure that out for the brain, the both of those. And so we keep, uh, you know, we keep about two decades behind, but heart health is important. What else? How about environmental factors? Difficult to, difficult to know for sure because we can't do a randomized controlled study, randomly um, exposed 100 of your firstborn children to environmental toxins, randomly assigned another to a control group. Um, but we do know some things matter. Um, we know that even just prenatally, perinatally, in childhood, exposure to lead, mercury, PCPs, causes attention deficit disorder, which is good news. You know, you know, a lot of us in this room are of the age, including myself, where most cars when we were kids were leaded. You know, we called that regular back then, but regular is just, what, 87 octane now? But that lead in the environment was actually causing problems. It gets stuck in the membranes around the neurons, and it affects how the neurons operate. Then you can just drive yourself crazy. This carpet, this carpet might have a fire retardant in it, and there's some evidence that that could be changing development. Um, uh, estrogenizing agents in development. So certainly we know prenatally, and it could be that throughout one's life, even just having too much mercury because you eat a can of tuna fish every day, yeah. that could cause changes in cognition um, if you're not careful. So yeah, there probably are some things there. Difficult to know for sure, though. Any other factors? What about sleep? I'm so glad you mentioned that, sleep. So I'm going to share some ideas related to <laughs> sleep here today, but one night of poor sleep for older adult reduces memory ability by 12% the next day. 12% reduction. It's not huge, but it is an effect. And even for college-age students, a poor sleep affects cognition. It affects inhibitory control. You know, if there's somebody in here who's, who's been, you know, in class for six hours today, and then they, they read a textbook for three hours, they're going to have a hard time paying attention. They would actually have a harder time not looking at their cell phone, research shows, because they're going to lose inhibitory abilities, and that's going to affect attention. So sleep is a big one. We really need what, to do what we can to maximize sleep without pharmaceutical interventions, because even the new sleeping medications, so we don't give people Valium. I don't even know if you could get a doctor to give you Valium for sleep anymore. Um, but there are some similar drugs. They're almost like benzodiazepines, but they have side effects, hangovers, just like Valium does. You don't know what Valium works on? Valium is a, you know, one of the most commonly prescribed tranquilizers. Valium works on the same receptor system that alcohol does. Now, the good news is it doesn't affect other organs as badly, but that you get almost a hangover effect. And even the modern uh, sleeping medications like Lunesta and Ambien, 
they work on that same system. The hangover effects aren't as bad, but the next day you're not going to be as sharp as you would have been. So we're going to have to focus on non-pharmacological interventions. And also uh, tolerance develops and actually makes it harder to go uh, to sleep when you go off those. But sleep's a big one. Any other factors? Yeah. Well, the, the more obvious hardware, concussions, brain trauma. Yeah. Uh, For every concussion you have, we think you are more likely to develop dementia. Hmm. Now, you know, it might be a 1% increase per concussion, but they do build up. And we see a lot of athletes, a lot of athletes who've received a lot of concussions have worse memory ability than they should for their age. So we do have to watch out for brain injuries as well. Yeah. Stress. Stress. That was the only other factor I was thinking of, stress. So stress in the short term and stress in the long run impacts memory. Stress shortens the life expectancy of your cells in your body. So they did this study. It's really kind of a sad study. But they had women who were caring for chronically or terminally ill children. They were going to a hospital like Dornbecker's up in Portland. Um, it wasn't Dornbecker's, but it was like that. And they, they were pretty stressed out, obviously. I mean, that's a, that's a really kind of a traumatic situation. And they looked at all these women, and we can actually see how stressed somebody is. We've done this research in my lab. We can see how stressed somebody is by putting a cotton swab in their mouth and then analyzing the cortisol levels. Have you heard of that before, cortisol? Cortisol is released when we're stressed. They did this to these women, and the top 10% most stressed out women in that population had cells 17 years older than they should have been. Their average age was 38, but if we looked at, we can actually age your cells. Every time your cells divide, and human so cells can divide up to 70 times, you lose a cap to the chromosome. It's called a telomere. And, and when those telomeres are gone, that cell's done. And so we can actually look at your telomere length and see how your life is going. Uh, we can also see how well you chose your parents because you get more telomeres depending on how well you chose your parents. They had cells consistent of 55-year-olds and their average age was 38. And we think that that was completely attributable to, completely explained by their increased levels of cortisol. We see it in the laboratory. So if there's never been a good reason to reduce stress, I mean, seriously, when I read that research, I was like, wow. I need to leave earlier before going to an appointment. I don't want to get stuck in traffic. Um, and also, we're going to talk about mindfulness training today because we can reduce the effects of stress. We can reduce stress with some easy coping mechanisms. So I wanted to share those with you as well. But that's it. I, you know, I'm going to go through and tell you more detail here, but we just kind of summarized the research. Genetics is half. Cognitive stimulation is a factor. Other health conditions, depression, anxiety, Parkinson's disease, there are other health conditions that can affect diabetes. Stress was mentioned, good sleep, social support and engagement, proper nutrition, and adequate physical exercise. That's it. And we're getting to the point now that this, these red ones, the environmental factors, are counting for almost 50% of the effects. Now, how the factors interact is a little bit um, of a mystery still, but we're getting really close to understanding it. So it frustrates me. It frustrates me to no end when people say, we have no cure for Alzheimer's. There's no way to slow it down. Technically, that might be true. There's no way to slow it down in the brain, but we can slow down the symptoms. We can slow down the symptoms through these environmental, um, these environmental interventions, particularly if we catch it early enough. So let's look at some of, these, um, some of these studies. So this is a recent study published in a fairly prestigious journal. They did eight-week intervention, three days a week. They had older adults do brain games that you could get on an iPad. You could get these brain for $30, and I'm going to show you which ones you could get. You could do this study with a loved one um, or yourself. What they did was three days a week, they exercised the heck out of their brain and compared these people to a control group. And what they found in just eight weeks, they had improvements in immediate memory, which is your ability to hold information and report it right back, important for conversations, important for understanding medical information, important for just getting along in life. Attention was improved, and attention's the key. This is what we're always trying to improve. I work with a lot of people around the country to help brain injured patients, uh, patients with early stage dementia, and that's what we always do. We go after attention. If we improve attention, we improve almost everything else. 
We improve things that we don't even exercise. We improve their ability to manage their checkbook. We improve their ability to take, remember that they already took their medication. We even improve their ability to drive safely and not fall. So this is the factor that most generalizes or transfers to the things we all need to do. And this is, so I wanted to throw in some very recent research, and I think this is where the research is going. We're not looking as much of these in isolation, these factors in isolation, but we're combining them. So look at this study. They did a 12-week program that combined both physical exercise and cognitive exercise. And we can do this in, in, in real time where they're doing their physical exercise and their cognitive exercise. This is the hottest topic in geriatric physical therapy right now. And we actually have one of the leading experts here in Oregon, Mike Studer, the president of Northwest Rehabilitation Associates. Seriously, if you want to see a good physical therapist, he's in Salem. There's 200,000 physical therapists in this country. He's been twice named the best by the American Physical Therapy Association, and he's one of the leaders in dual tasking. Um, so they did this, mixing the physical and cognitive. I've seen Mike do this. Mike has an obstacle course in his, in his clinics. And so he does things like he has them walk through the obstacle course. And these people that are at fall risk, and they have to pour water back between two measuring cups, step up and over gate belts, up and down steps, while thinking of a first name for a female, A through Z, Abigail, Betty, Christine, Dolores, Ethel. And when you do this, you actually decrease their chance of falling. And for some populations, you dramatically increase how quickly and safely they can navigate a more complex environment like being at the grocery store. So that's a really hot topic right now. And this researcher found improvement in attention and it was further proven that the brain activity with brain imaging was more efficient in the frontal lobe that's the part of the brain that controls attention. So we now not only have observable evidence from their performance on cognitive tasks, but we also have evidence from brain imaging. So that's really exciting. I'd already shared this idea with you that 15% of this equation is related to mental activity, doing things like we're doing now, doing things like Sudoku, doing things like word searches, doing things like iPads, or just doing things like coming to lecture series. So being socially engaged. It's not all about doing a game or a puzzle. You just do the things that you enjoy doing throughout your life, and that, we've known for a long time, has an effect. So we did one of the very first randomized controlled studies in this area. A lot of people had done, well, some people had done before we started doing this research 13 years ago at Western. People had found that uh, the population that was most cognitively engaged was least likely to develop dementia. They found a correlation between cognitive activity and reduction in dementia rates. So what type of study is that, students? The true experiment, correlational or case study? It's correlational. Students, please finish this, this phrase for me. Correlation does not equal? Oh my gosh, that's music to my ears, thank you. <laughs> Do you everybody hear that? Correlation does not equal causation, right? Just because two variables are correlated does not necessarily mean one variable caused the other, right? So, I mean, there's a correlation between how much ice cream is consumed in a given county in July and your chance of drowning in that county <laughs> for that same month. Oh, no. But it does not mean that ice cream is causing yeah. people to drown. It's what? It's July, it's heat, you know, so if it gets hotter, they're going to eat more ice cream, they're going to be more likely to swim in a river, and all of that. So, and this is, this is actually true, this is not an academic, you know, little side conversation, because in brain health, we know the people that do more cognitive stimulation are more socially engaged. We know the people who are more socially engaged doing cognitive stimulation eat better. They're less likely um, to have uh, high cholesterol and high blood pressure, they're more likely to go to a doctor. They're less likely to have low vitamin B levels that have gone undiagnosed. They're less likely to do a lot of things that could lead to dementia. So what we have to do is we have to randomly assign people to an intervention group or a control group. And we did that uh, beginning in 2002 all along the I-5 corridor as a team of students, we had almost 20 undergraduate students going into assisted living facilities along the I-5 corridor and we randomly assigned people to have their brains exercised for three months or they were put into a control group 
and they didn't do anything different for three months. Then we gave them the program when it was all over. And what we found was in three months of exercising their brain and really kind of a beta version of the activities that are now available in 2015, we saw a 15% improvement in the intervention group's ability to make new memories of names, faces, stories, routes, appointments, where they put something, things we all need to do to stay independent. 15% improvement in this score in just three months. Uh, the control group stayed the same. We published this paper in the Journal of Mental Health and Aging, and we concluded if older adults can maintain their cognitive ability, they're going to require less care, possibly delay or eliminate the need for skilled nursing. These cognitively stimulating activities may postpone the symptoms of dementia, which could delay the need for more intensive care. And I chose these, we chose these words very carefully, postpone symptoms of dementia. So here's the deal. Doing Sudoku, doing word searches, socializing, coming to a lecture is not going to prevent the amyloid buildup in the brain, the neurofibrillary tangles, the tau proteins, the Lewy bodies. Have you heard of these things before? The telltale signs of dementia. But you know what it does? It prevents the symptoms. And let me explain. I just got one study it's a, it's, a, it's a very well-publicized study, and it will perfectly summarize 100 studies. So it's one of the nun studies. Have you heard about the nun studies? They had 800 nuns and clergymen we followed for over 60 years. They're most they're based out of the Boston area. And every year or two, they came into the lab, and they did a whole series of memory and mental tests. And then they all donated their brains to science when they died. So I'm told somewhere in a room in Boston, are 800 nun brains. Kind of creepy, actually. But, um, or part of their brain was donated. Well, many studies, people always say the nun study. There are actually many studies. Last I counted, over 40 publications from their data. One of the studies perfectly encapsulates this idea. They had the nuns take memory tests the whole time they were in the study, and they looked at the last memory test before they died. They also looked at the number of cognitively stimulating activities they reported. So they had a survey. How many times a week do you read a book, newspaper, do puzzles, word games, teach Sunday school, um, you know, things like that. It wasn't a very long list, but it got a good sense of their level of mental engagement in life. And they put the nuns into four groups. The ones who did the most, the top quarter, middle, middle, and the bottom quarter, the ones that did the least. It's called a quartile split. We split them into quartiles and we compare the top to the bottom and we ignore the people in the middle. We do this a lot in science. And they looked at the nuns who were the top 25%, the ones that were still volunteering, they were still involved in the community, they were reading, they were still learning, even in their 80s and 90s. And they looked at their last memory test and what do you think? Was their memory test good or bad? Top quartile good. Their memory test for the top quartile was really good. It was better than it should have been for their age. It was better than the other nuns in the study. And then they looked at their brains. And this is where the researchers were surprised because they actually had some of the telltale signs of dementia in their brains, even though their memory was good. You know what was going on? What we think was going on is an explanation for use it or lose it. We think they had redundant connections amongst their neurons. Neurons can branch and communicate with up to thousands of other neurons. One neuron in some parts of the brain can branch and communicate with up to 20,000 other neurons. And I hope you have a brain like that. If you do, you're less likely to get dementia. And being socially engaged, learning new things is what does that. So these nuns could actually have some damage to their brain, but they could still get the information through, pay attention, make a new memory. Now let's contrast them to the bottom 25%. The nuns that uh, didn't want to teach Sunday school anymore. Do I have to? No, you don't have to. I don't want to do it then. Do you want a free subscription to the newspaper? Not really. Do you read books? Not much. Do you volunteer? No, not much. Essentially, we're talking about the slacker nuns. <laughs> and they looked at the slacker nuns, and what do you think? Memory, good or bad? Bad. Memory wasn't as good as the rest of the nuns. They went into their brains, and once again, they were surprised. They did not find proportionally more telltale signs of dementia in the slacker nun brains relative to the most active. Now, their brains weren't as good as you would like, 
but they could actually have had less damage to their brain and more impairment. You see what I'm saying? Compared to the group over here could actually have more impairment and actually still be able to pay attention and make a new memory. This is an explanation for use it or lose it. And we actually call it the reserve hypothesis. The more you have in your brain, the more you can lose without having a problem. And this is true for, I know some of you are thinking about this right now. Somebody in here is thinking about, how about people with attention deficit disorder? Are they gonna be at risk later? If attention is this important, what if you have attention deficit disorder? Well, actually, we are finding evidence of that. You know, people who are in their 80s and 90s didn't generally get ADD diagnoses, but middle-aged adults with attention deficit disorder are actually having more problems than they should for their age. Essentially, they don't have the reserve to handle, you know, the loss that's going to ha naturally happen to all of us. So that's it. That's the reserve hypothesis. So Sudoku. Sudoku is really one of the best activities. I'd like everybody to know how to do Sudoku. Does anybody, could anybody complete a nine by nine if your life depended on it? A couple of you could. Do we have any Sudoku addicts? Good, good. Recovering addicts? Okay, there's a 12 step for that. But, um, so I want everybody to know how to do Sudoku. And actually, who, who was that? Is a person in here? I saw somebody doing, I don't think he's here, in my Psych 201 class. He was doing Sudoku before class. Um, that was kind of cool. But, um, so I want everybody here to know how to do Sudoku. There's only three rules. You need to have numbers one through nine in every horizontal row, numbers one through nine in every vertical column, and numbers one through nine in every subsquare. So you see that upper left subsquare there? Numbers one through nine. Middle, upper, up, uh, subsquare, one, one through nine. Center subsquare, one through nine. Okay, do any of our addicts, so here's the question for our addicts. <laughs> What goes right there? Only one number can go there. And it's not three. Five. five, yeah. It has to be a five. Five has to go there. It's the only one because look at this five right here in the top row. So no five can go there. We need a five somewhere in here. We got a five right here. No five can go here. We need a five somewhere. It has to go there. Make sense? Let's look at the center subsquare. The center subsquare is missing numbers 1, 5, and 9. Tell me, does 5 go into cell A, B, or C? A. 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 Well done. That was quick. 5 was already in C, the column C, so we know the 5 can't go here. So as soon as you notice this 5 right here, you know the 5 can't go here. It must go there. Now we're just missing numbers 1 and 9. Does 1 go into cell A or cell B? A. Yeah, you got it. And then a little deductive reasoning tells us nine goes there, although I, I always do recommend using a pencil. Oh, yes. Going right to left, what about up and down? Yeah, so you would need to go up and down, you need numbers one through nine, too. Okay. So like right here, so what do we have? So very center, one, two, three. So we're missing four. We got four and nine. Four and nine. So where does four go, cell A or cell B? A. Yep, I don't have that one to turn red for you, but yeah, all one through nine, too. Yeah, you got it. And they're, they're fun, and it's rewarding. It seems to be more engaging than some other activities we know that works well. Um, however, I think it's better to start people with four by fours, particularly if they're having a little bit of cognitive impairment. Um, so we start them with a four by four. Um, this is an easy four by four. And then we have six by sixes, and then they can go and get a whole book of them. And so. I've actually made a lot of these for people, and it's just on my website, robwinningham.com. It's on the uh, article, Crossword Puzzles Are Not As Good As Sudoku Puzzles. I'm sorry, that's true. Crossword puzzles are not as good as Sudoku puzzles. And please don't argue with me. People just line up to argue with me after these lectures. I, I won't, I, they do. Um, but research has shown this. Um, now, crossword puzzles aren't going to hurt. They're not going to hurt. But there's no evidence that they help. There's no evidence that they help. And let me tell you why. What do you do with a crossword puzzle? Like, what's the activity? You retrieve previously learned information. Retrieve. Have you ever known someone with early to mid-stage dementia? Think about your conversation when a loved one or somebody you knew had early stage dementia. Their old memories are fine. I, I completely trust somebody with early stage dementia's memory of 40 years ago. I do not trust their memory of 40 minutes ago, though, right? 
You know, so that's the difference. Earlier stages of dementia are the inability to make a new memory. And it's an inability to make a new memory largely mediated by attention and concentration impairments. So that's why Sudoku worked. And I always knew that would be the case. And then an article came out in 2013 that showed something like crossword puzzles had no benefit on memory, but something like Sudoku, the work attention, did. And I've actually linked that, that short article I wrote, um, which I highly recommend for those of you that are struggling or whenever you have a hard time uh, going to sleep, because it will put you to sleep, <laughs> the original scientific article, that is. Word searches are good. This is a, be a really easy word search, but word searches do this too. Have you ever done that, where you get a hard word search and, and you got that letter, and then you, you try to find that, you start the letter it starts with, and you go through, and never you find, then you go around it. I mean, that's actually, that's perfect. It's not as fun as Sudoku, but that's exactly the type of thing that improves cognition. To have sustained attention, don't become distracted, stay focused, do a visual scan as fast as you can. That's what we all need to do to exercise our brains. But you've got to find fun ways to do that. But that's exactly the part of the brain you want to improve. So this stuff is ubiquitous now. Um, you can get books of word searches, you can get books of anagrams, you can get books of Sudokus, you can get the apps, and I'll share some of our best apps with you. So there's no excuse. Um, I mean, just go to the dollar store, you can get a whole book of these things, cheap. They cost like, well, a dollar actually. Um, and, uh, and you're good to go. So let's talk about the apps, because th this is a game changer. It used to cost thousands of dollars to get software as good as you can get for 20 bucks now. I'm, I'm not kidding. There were a lot of uh, com uh, rehab settings, retirement communities that literally spent tens of thousands of dollars, the best ones spent tens of thousands of dollars for what you can get for $25 if you have a tablet now. Uh, and I'm not joking, I'm not at all exaggerating that. It might even be better than what you could have got. And so we did, um, Oh, I don't have a picture. Oh, I, I took a picture out because you might know them. I, I usually have a picture of some people at Capitol Manor um, down the road. We did a feasibility study, but I thought somebody might be here, but nobody is here from that feasibility study. Um, so I took the picture out, though. But anyway, this is, these are the apps that we like the best. And so I made handouts for everybody um, so you could see these if you want to try these out. FitBrains was my favorite. So FitBrains is a subscription service. If you get it wrong, it gets easier. If you get it right, it gets harder. And there's many different games. It, it, I think it's the best. More people have heard of Lumosity, and Lumosity is good. I think it's the second best, in my opinion. Um, but I think Fit Brains is better. Rosetta Stone is so good, Rosetta Stone just bought it, the language learning company. Um, but there are a lot that are more discreet. Has anybody ever been addicted to Tetris? Tetris, very addicting. Wait till, for the students in here, wait till after final exams before downloading it on your phone. Um, it was developed by a Soviet computer scientist in the 1980s, and I always thought it was just a ploy to reduce the educational achievement of American university students. Um, I got addicted to it in 1992. Um, Sudoku 2 is my favorite uh, Sudoku app, and I'm going to show you a couple of others. Memory Block um, is one of my all-time favorites. Memory Block is something that uh, will look familiar to some of you. So let's go to side screen. What is that? Oh. Simon, yeah. So it's going to give us, so green, red. It's going to keep getting harder. Green, red, green. Green, red, green, red. Now it's going to give us five. Oh, gosh, it's making it easy. Okay. Oh, what do I do next? Yellow. <laughs> there you go. So you don't need to watch me play Sudoku, but, or uh, Simon. But this is called Memory Block. Um, so it's going to cost, I don't know what the cost is, 99 cents, $2. I'm usually willing to pay the extra dollar not to get the ads. They're kind of intrusive when you have, when you have a choice. But that is it. That's going to work executive functioning. And this is going to improve executive functioning, you know, not only in adults, but also children. So, I mean, this is important, I think, to think about some of these apps, if they're done right, to enhance executive functioning and attention um, uh, in all of us. 
All right, so we have that. Going down the list here, uh, Stroop effect is a good one, visual attention, brain lab. We have various word searches, jigsaw puzzles, brain channel. So these are all apps that we vetted. We tried three times this many apps in our feasibility study where we bought a couple of dozen iPads, um, and these were the ones we liked the best. And then the final one I'll end in is watch that. So what it's going to do, it's going to seal five. We need to remember where they are. One, two, three, oh, it's four, top or bottom? Bottom, bottom good job. And then if we get it right, it might go to five again, then six. So one more time at five. Left or right? Left. Good. Wow. Okay, we're going to do one more at five. I think it's going to go to six next. Top or bottom? Bottom. Ooh, now it's, this is hard. Oh, where's three? And top, top, center. Top, top? Actually, I forget. There, okay. And then we'll probably give a six one more time, and then we're going to stop here. But, and then it goes to seven. And something kind of magical happens at seven because, students, what is the capacity of short-term memory? Oh, my gosh. You guys are making my evening. Did you hear what they all said? Seven plus or minus two. That's the capacity of short-term memory. That's how much we can hold. And at seven, it, you really feel it kind of break down. Um, and so this is exactly it. It's fun. You do it for five minutes. And if you have a bunch of different apps, um, it doesn't, it's, it's a game. But th these are chosen for very specific reason. There's a lot of other games you can get which are not on that list. But I think you're starting to see how these are really working attention, concentration, inhibition, executive functioning, because we know that's what generalizes, and that's what we have to do. Some researchers haven't done that, and there are some studies in the literature, and, and they're always the same. They don't have the focus on executive functioning, they don't do as many things, and then they only get better at the activities they did. In order to generalize, you really need to have a, a, a lot of different, a wide variety of executive functioning activities. All right, so, um, and then on my website, robwinningham.com, if you ever want more information or come back to it, I just have a, a short article, and then we list our favorite apps. You can't, you can't download the apps there, but you can see the ones that we thought worked well, and when I learn about new ones, then we put those on that uh, particular blog post. So let's quickly talk about physical exercise. Uh, this is the factor that the National Institutes of Health is most confident about. Um, this field was broken open in 2003 when uh, Art Kramer from the University of Illinois and one of his colleagues combined the data from 18 published studies. This is called a meta-analysis or an analysis of a bunch of analyses. And they combined all of the data and they found that on average, people that engaged in a new physical exercise program had a half a standard deviation improvement in cognitive abilities. Half a standard deviation. That's maybe not something that's meaningful to you, um, something we teach in statistics, but then you might forget. But a half a standard deviation for students in uh, Psych 301 or Psych 467, they'll know that's considered a meaningful and significant increase. Whenever you get a half a standard deviation, it's real and it's robust. But if you're not sure about this, that's an IQ difference of 100 to 108. That's a half a standard deviation improvement in IQ. And if you're not sure about IQ scores, I'll tell you, that's a huge IQ difference. In fact, an IQ difference of 100 to 108, that's the difference between a duck and a beaver. <laughs> and you get all of that from physical exercise. So. All right. So even just looking, this is a, called a tertiary analysis, top third to bottom third. Anybody have a Fitbit? Anybody here wearing Fitbit? That's what I want for Christmas. No, one Fitbit. We only have two, fit, two Fitbits. Do I see three? Three Fitbits. No, three. We got three. Do I see four? Um, no. So what this is, they're called actographs, and we've been using these for a long time in research. You could actually get um, pedometers in the 1950s were widely available, um, but you wear them on the wrist and it just measures movement, right? And, um, and then they download the data, and the top third, the people that move the most, we're 61% less likely to ever develop dementia. Now, this is a correlational study, so you gotta take it with a grain of salt, but we do have randomized controlled studies in this area. And we know that a mixture of aerobic and strength training is the best. We actually learned that first in the meta-analysis. That popped out 
in 2003. This is the study that I'm most excited about from the past five years. It's strength training, it's resistance training. And what we know is a different brain hormone, it's called a brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And you want these, or you want certain ones. Different brain-derived neurotrophic factors are increased for aerobic training versus strength training. And, what, and so most people have been exercising, walking, jogging, doing an elliptical, maybe a stationary bicycle, something like that. But actually, you get an independent, or what we say an orthogonal benefit by doing the resistance training. It's a different mechanism. And they both lead to improvements in executive functioning. So this is the lab that's done most of the research. And um, she reported that once a week resistance training for a year led to an 11% improvement in attention. That's it, attention. Twice a week was only 13%. So these people got most of the benefit for once a week. Now, unfortunately, you know, I look out at the college students here, unfortunately, this does not seem to be true for young adults. This becomes true in middle adulthood, and then the older we get, the more true it becomes. So they've even said people 75 and older, it improves their memory more than people 60 to 75. And then, and then you know, it improves people in their 50s, but not as much as the others. So sometimes students will do experiments. They'll have people just lift weights or run the track to see if it improves their memory ability, and it never works for college students. So don't do that for your Psych 301 project. Yeah. When we started the class, you said that there were better times of day than Yeah, so yeah, when I first opened, I said we even know the best time of day. So they have found that for women, exercising in the morning was most effective um, when a number of things. It actually helped them fall asleep quicker at night, um, and it led to better improvements in memory. Um, there could be what we now know about sleep is that there's morning people and, well, you actually knew this your whole life, but now scientists are studying morning people and night people, um, and so there probably is some variability there, but morning is, seem, does seem to be the best. What about for men? They didn't have that effect, and I don't know why. Um, you know another one? So th there's research shows women benefit more from physical exercise than men. And there's biochemists devoting their life to figuring out the chemistry of this. I think they're on a fool's errand, though. Have you ever seen women exercise? Yes. What do they do? Sweat. They sweat. <laughs> <laughs> they, they talk. They're with their friends. Some do. Some do, yeah. So women, on average, I think, are more likely to socialize. That's what my, that's what my wife does. My wife doesn't exercise alone. She exercises with her girlfriends. I don't think she would exercise by herself very much, you know? And they, you know, so maybe it's the social engagement that does that. Um, I don't know. Could be. All right, so physical exercise, um, aerobic training and strength training. So I, I don't know. I hope that's motivating. So for the college students, the motivation too is um, it will actually help reduce stress and anxiety, and that will help improve memory. So there is a, a reason to do this in college students, but I think all of us should get more of that. So the, in terms of diet, the one thing we do know we have pretty good evidence on is good fat. I love it. Good fat. Good fat. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Do you know any other oxymorons? Government efficiency. What is it? Government efficiency? I wasn't going to say that and all, but okay, since you did. Jumbo shrimp? A precise estimate? Anymore? Pretty ugly? <laughs> My final complete rough draft? And good fat. Anyway, this good fat is actually it's in a lot of foods. And people often focus on the fish and the nuts. It's actually in a lot of different foods, just in different proportions. But it is true that fish has something called DHA. It's an acronym for a much longer word. Um, DHA is only found in fish or a marine algae, and DHA has been most consistently linked to improved cognitive functioning compared to other aspects of omega-3 fatty acids. We know that individuals who have lower levels of DHA are less likely to have dementia. Um, we know the more fish people eat, the less likely they are to develop dementia. So let's do the study now. We'll replicate this study. Raise your hand if you eat fish once a week or more or take fish oil supplement you are less likely to get dementia compared to people who are not raising their hand. Mm. That's what the study found. Does no. it matter whether it's farm-raised or wild, or is it DHA in all of them? So does it matter if it's farmed, raised, or wild? The, 
So we think that the DHA is an antifreeze. And so if it's a pen raised salmon, for example, it's not going to go really deep. But the wild salmon is going to go deeper. So it probably is going to have slightly higher uh, levels of some omega-3s is, is the thinking on this. But I would actually be more concerned about, um, and we never know this. This is not something you can easily figure out. But wild, so what do we feed them? We feed them food pellets. Where do we get the food pellets from? We get them from coastal fish, fish that's fairly close in, can be more likely to have pollution in it yeah. versus the salmon that's eating halfway between here and Hawaii. And so, so in some sense, I think we'd be more worried about the mercury in that. Um, but most fish, even shrimp, which has almost no detectable mercury in PCPs, even shrimp still has DHA. But it's just in varying levels. Like the cold water cod is one of the highest omega-3, so they, they do differ. But they also differ in terms of their um, toxin levels. So this is, uh, seems to be an important factor. And here's a more recent study, really an amazing study. I mean, if you think about the undertaking this study would, be, would, would um, require, they looked at 15,000 people in Latin America and Asia. Why do you think they went to Latin America and Asia to do this fish study? Oh, the fishing coasts. A lot of people in these parts of the world eat fish every day. Mm -hmm. And they found those people that ate fish every day, and they were 20% less likely to ever get dementia compared to those who ate it only three days a week. But don't feel bad if you're a three-day-a-week eater because you'd be 20% less likely to get dementia compared to those who rarely eat fish. Um, so it does appear to be dose-dependent. Be smart about the fish you get, though. I, I, I know, knew a gentleman here in town. He actually had the longest-running business in Monmouth. He was a widower, um, and uh, uh, he used to run the dry cleaners. And uh, he told me, so you know who I'm talking about? Jimmy, Jimmy Young. And uh, just a really neat guy. And, uh, and Jimmy Young, he told me his secret. So he ran the dry cleaners for 50 years here in town. And they moved to Independence when he retired at 90. He retired at 90. Um, and he had a girlfriend. I shouldn't be telling you too much information now. But, um, but anyway, um, he ate a can of tuna every day. And he thought that was his secret. But he pulled me, he always called me Doc. He said, he pulled me aside, Doc. He's like, he's like, but I gotta tell you, I had to switch to the white flaky. Well, why? Well, there's too much mercury in the, in the, uh, in the albacore, and, uh, and I got mercury poisoning, and I couldn't think so well. <laughs> now, now, so that can happen. You know, so white albacore is a bigger fish, and the mercury goes up the food chain. The cheap stuff is actually lower in mercury. You know, so you just have to be smart about it. You can have halibut, you can have the big fish like the, the, the ahi tuna, but you do want to be careful. You don't want to eat it every meal. You probably don't want to eat a large chunk of it every day. Omega or fish oil taken three times a day decreases your cholesterol rather significantly in many people. Yeah, so the comment is... Um, so a fish oil supplement taken several times a day could decrease cholesterol. Um, th there's a couple of things going on there. One, it, it actually increases good cholesterol. That's, that's usually the effect we see. Um, but so it can affect your cholesterol profile in, in a good way. Um, but here's the deal, and I just want you all to know this, because I've been fat following this, this really close. We even published a paper in the journal Nutritional Neuroscience about this. Too much fish oil can actually, actually lead to damage to your cells. And I think this is something that the medical community really needs to come to grips with because people, when their cholesterol is way out of whack, we tell them to take a whole bunch of fish oil. But it's actually a peroxidizing agent. So a study was published in 2009, and I don't get the sense that a lot of doctors know about this study, but it actually damages the cells. And then I got one more bad news. I thought this was the magic drug, nutrition, and then it changes. Two studies report that it increases prostate cancer risk in men in large doses. And I recently told this to a bunch of uh, geriatric MDs in Sun River. There was a conference. And I was like, what do you guys think? They're all MDs, mostly, and there are nurses there. And then one um, elderly um, geriatric MD, and he stood up, very formal, and he's like, well... All of us men in this room are going to get prostate cancer if we live long enough. I'd rather have prostate cancer and deal with it than have dementia. 
And he sat back down. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. The incident to prostate cancer is 100% at age 90. Yeah, exactly. So if we all live long enough, we're all going to get it. But it does seem to... The dose of fish oil, most of the studies, actually OHSU has done more studies on this than I think any other university. And they usually use 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams. And that's about the size, like if you get this, it comes at Costco, it's 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams. But the study on the proxidation, 2,400 milligrams led to proxidative, dan proxidative stress in the cerebrospinal fluid. So it looks like just one, but I know some doctors are prescribing more for cholesterol profiles. Really, it's hard to know. There always seems to be a give and take. Uh, is there a difference between just taking the oil, like, a, you know, versus the supplements? Or the yeah, so the difference between the oil and the supplements, um, we make the assumption in the science that the oil, the fish oil supplements, is the same as the actual fish. But I think that's a, an assumption that we could challenge. There's no study that I know of that knows that this says any different. Um, but does it denature over time? Yeah. So cod liver oil versus the, the oil from uh, a tablet, I don't know of any difference, but it does denature over time. So w we actually worked with a biochemist from the food industry, and we reviewed every study in the area. A student did a thesis, um, and, and he's a brilliant man. So PhD in biochemistry, retired from the food industry, um, and he worked with us, and he said, actually, we, gotta, we should be refrigerating oil. And I, and I know you don't refrigerate oil, but he thinks we should be. He refrigerates all of his oil, and he's a brilliant man. He actually predicted that peroxidation effect before that study even came out. He, he said, this is going to be peroxidizing. You don't want to take too much. And then a year later, a study came out. He's a brilliant man. So he, they refrigerate all their oils. And, and if you know this, if you ever smelled like oil, I mean, I, it's always happens in our house. You know, you could buy a big bottle of it, and you just smell it. I mean, it's that terrible. I mean, if you bake something with it, it's awful. That, at that point, that oil could actually be damaging. Yeah. So you got to get it fresh. And so I'm that annoying person. Do you do that at the grocery store and you get milk? I shouldn't admit this in front of so many people, but you go to the back and you get that one when the front date's about to expire. I do that at Costco for fish oil. It's also, and, and then we refrigerate it, and then we, we, we bring some out. Yeah, yeah, and then there would be other good things about having the liver versus just the oil from the whole fish. So I don't think that there's a study on that, but comparing the two, but there are studies showing the cod liver oil has similar effects. All right, so there's also evidence, and OHSU published some of this, that the fish oil supplements can reduce depression. Um, and I think that's important to note because there are relatively few side effects compared to an antidepressant. And the, the, the research is fairly robust, and there's quite a few studies that have shown this, but very few people know about it um, because it's, you know, a drug company can't make a billion dollars off of it. And it might be that this is reducing inflammation. It could also be that this whole thing is keeping our axons healthy. So our axons is what determine... Um, the myelin, the thickness of this uh, insulator here, determines how quick the signal travels down the axon. Speed limit in the human brain is 270 miles per hour, and there's evidence that the fish oil keeps this healthy. We also think this is why women who consume fish oil during pregnancy have children with slightly higher IQ. Mm. Because the myelin determines speed of processing, and that's about a quarter of your IQ is related to speed of processing. And then mindfulness training. This is one of the hottest topics in this field right now, and it's one of the easiest to do. So mindfulness training is a lot of things. You can focus on your breath. Um, you can do a body scan. You can focus on positive emotions. There's a lot of different ways to do mindfulness training, but research shows it can lead to improvements in executive functioning, uh, and which is like your memory capacity. And it's easy to do. We can try it right here, right now, really quick. I use an app called the Mindfulness Trainer. So it looks like this. So it's just called Mindfulness Trainer. I'll go back, show you what it looks like. And you got all of these different, you've got all of these different types of activities here. So we can do moving, mindfulness training, sitting, body scan. So I'm just going to focus on sitting here. And um, 
If you don't have uh, any training in this, you just get this app. I think it's $2.99. And sitting with attention. And she's going to run us through this. Five minute meditation. Sit down in a comfortable, alert position. And let's take some time to sit with attention for five minutes. All right, I don't want you to fall asleep on me, so we're going to stop right here. But this is it. So literally hours upon hours of an expert teaching you how to do this. Research shows that leads to improvements in working memory capacity and executive functioning. And this is something that everybody in this room could benefit from. Do you want to be more present? Do you want to not think about things that are intrusive? Do you want to turn off negative emotions? Aren't there times where you know, you're, you're mad about something, you don't want to be mad, you know, or you're sad, and this is not the time to break down over it. Um, this is, or somebody has cut you off and you don't want to be that person on the road. This helps with all of that. Um, this allows us to control our emotions. This also allows us to control our attention. And if that's not enough, research shows it'll make you funnier. <laughs> seriously, seriously, there's research that shows doing this, and, and you know it before. Have you ever done that, where you have this, the, you know, you're having a social interaction, and then 15 seconds later, your mind was sort of half in, half out, and 15 seconds later, you think of that really funny thing to say, but it's too late, and you can't bring the conversation back to say it? Well, you'll be more present, you'll be more able to say it, research shows. So. And if that's not enough, it can lead to um, decreased chance of falling in older adults because falls and attention are very much related. So that's the, uh, the app. And I think that's in your handout, isn't it? I, yeah, I wanted it to have that so any of you could find it. There's certainly other apps. It's, I looked around. It's the one that I like the best. Um, she said such a soothing voice. What's the cost? $2.99. All right, our final topic here, sleep in memory. Older adults spend more time in bed than younger adults, but unfortunately, older adults actually get less sleep. About 9% of people between the ages of 20 and 30 have diagnosable insomnia, but that number goes up as high as, some estimates, 50% in people 65 and older. So this is really kind of an issue of aging. It's unfortunately a fairly normal part of aging, um, but it can lead to some really serious side effects. So there's a scientific study or more for every single one of these factors. And I'm not going to read them to you, but you can read them yourself. But insomnia or poor sleep is associated with all of those things. This negatively affects quality of life. And in my opinion, and I think opinion of other cognitive neuroscientists, we've gone way too far on this idea that getting by on four hours of sleep is almost macho. It's almost indicative of the Protestant work ethic. You, you know what I'm talking about? You've seen this. We've all seen that. We've taken this too far. This is damaging our lives, getting four, or five, six hours of sleep. But unfortunately, some people are having a hard time getting more sleep and better sleep. And so, you know, you know this. You knew that sleep was, lack of sleep was going to cause problems. And it also affects memory. Insomnia can lead to memory impairment. So this was the study that I cited earlier, that poor sleep, a, night, a sleepless night, decreased the ability to recognize the right answer from 86 to 74%. I would translate that to a 12% reduction in memory, at least for that type of memory ability. So I'm going to end this with 15 non-pharmacological sleep interventions and recommendations. I didn't make these up. This comes from mostly from the sleep specialist. I kind of just put my own twist on it. The first thing is, when possible, try to keep regular hours. You know, and I think for college students, that's hard. You know, you're, you're having all-nighters. You might have a fun night out plan. Um, but if possible, if you're struggling with sleep, try to go to bed, get up at a similar time. And you notice when you do that, I'm pretty regimented. I mean, I wake up. I mean, it's almost embarrassing, like within a minute or two every day. You know, I go to sleep within... 15 minutes, and I always get up within five minutes of the previous day unless something strange happened, and that helps improve sleep. Exercise. If I didn't give you enough reasons to exercise, exercise actually helps improve sleep quality. Some people do not do well with evening exercise if they have insomnia, though. A lot of variability in this. It also depends on how tired you are, but for most people, exercising in the evening 
can make it a little harder to get to sleep for at least two hours, maybe up to four hours after the, the exercise. So we have to watch out for that. One study found that a four-month exercise program led to improvements in sweet sleep quality, time it took to fall asleep, and duration of sleep, so quantity and quality. Number three, and, and I took this directly, they always phrase it this way, and I find it funny. They say, don't drink too much alcohol after dinner because it's going to impair the quality of your sleep. So I guess the takeaway is you need to get all your drinking in before dinner. Um, <laughs> Avoid nicotine and uh, caffeine. You knew this, you don't need a slide to tell you this, but both nicotine and caffeine will reduce how long uh, people stay asleep. Um, one study found that caffeine consumption after 4 p.m. reduced sleep time from 6.9 was the control group that drank their caffeine before 5 p.m. 5.6 hours was drinking caffeine after 4 p.m. So, and I think we all know that, but it's a, uh, support for that idea. This is one, I, I think this is really important for us to talk about real quickly because this has changed. 10 years ago, you could have gone into Salem Hospital Sleep Clinic and their brochure would have said, don't nap. So their sleep quality brochure would say, don't nap. And it took the medical establishment a long time to change, even in the face of a lot of studies. So this is an area I've even written, wrote a book chapter about this and read all of the research and we know that napping improves or increases the amount of time sleep for 24 hour period and it decreases the amount of time at sleep at night just by a few minutes. So overall you get more time in a 24 hour period. But I think where this came from, you know, often there's a grain of truth, even in old wives tales there's a grain of truth because people got messed up. If you take a three hour nap in the middle of the day, that's gonna really mess things up. Um, my youngest child is five and my wife and I, we always kind of freak out when he falls asleep at like 5.30 p.m. and we can't wake him up and it's 7.30, we know our evening shot, right? I mean, seriously, I mean, then we start dividing up the night. Okay, I'll take till 1.30 a.m. No, I want you to take it till, you know, anyways, but start negotiating that because you know the sleep is gonna be messed up. So we want the naps to be relatively short. There's some variability in this, but there's two types of naps. One's the power nap, and there's research on this. Power nap is a 20 minute nap. You're going to probably go into just alpha wave sleep, and that improves visual vigilance. But a 90 minute nap, this is what I would recommend if you're really motivated for the college students around final exam time, because you will consolidate some memories from what you were just studying you'll cement those memories in place. But you need to set an alarm and you need to be very motivated because you know what's gonna happen? Sleep momentum. That's our term for it, sleep momentum. So you'll do that and you're like, you're so tired that you actually go into a second round of sleep cycles after 90 minutes and you might not be able to, to wake up. And so you just need to be very motivated to do that 90 minute nap. But if you can do a 90 minute nap, it actually cements the memories from the previous day. It's a great way to study, but you have to be very motivated. Maybe have some uh, caffeine close by. Unwind in the evening. Don't go to bed starved or stuff. Don't associate the bedroom with wakefulness. So um, they recommend, this is actually one I found to be one of the most effective strategies. When you can't go to sleep, get up. You don't want to classically condition your bed to be associated with wakefulness. And some people will do that. Really severe insomniacs, you know, and they sit there and they're like, all right, if I go to sleep now, I can get six hours of sleep. Okay, go. All right, and then half hour passes. If I go to sleep now, I can get five hours, five and a half hours, go, you know. And their bed becomes associated with wakefulness. So the next time they lay down, they're waking up. That's classical conditioning. So what you do is you get up, do something different. Preferably don't look at a screen. Because the screen, the blue light, there's a lot of blue wavelengths. Short wavelength light comes out of screens, TV, phones. Uh, tablets, and we know the blue wavelength impairs sleep. So this is research from the past two years. It makes it harder to fall asleep. So we really have to control that, but I know a lot of us do it, right? You're looking at the phone or the tablet or the TV before sleep, but that's not good. It prevents melatonin from being released, and melatonin is what makes us go to sleep. Don't ruminate in bed. Are you the type of person that when you lay down, you lay down, you relax, you kick back in bed, 
and you think of all the stupid things you said during the day. And you think of all the things you need to do tomorrow. And you think of all the things you need to add to your to-do list. Am I the only one that does that? No, okay. So if you do that, write it down. Just write it down. That's what the sleep experts say. Just keep a pad by your bed and write it down. You know, I, I find that for meditation too. I'm like, I'm like trying to do some mindfulness meditation training and I think of the thing I need to do. You just got to write it down and then go back to it. So that actually can be very effective if that's your style. Create a sleep ritual. That street sleep ritual is classical conditioning. Um, it can facilitate sleep. Control light and thus melatonin release. Make the sleeping environment as comfortable as possible. Um, get exposure to natural light. This is one you all are probably doing relatively okay on this, but you have to watch out. We're entering the time period where it's hard to get a lot of natural light. And natural light is what regulates our night-day cycle. We are probably doing okay. We'll be a little bit vitamin D deprived come February, unless you go out of your way to get exposure to light. But you know who is really struggling? People in skilled nursing people in assisted living. Research actually shows, now, and you don't get it through, you don't get it through the window. Windows actually filter some of the UV spectrum. Like, have you ever seen a child with uh, jaundice? You know, and you need to actually do, like, give it light. You need to give the child light, but you can't give it light through a window. It actually has to be direct sunlight or they actually have some special lights they've made for them. Um, so the same is true for this. 20 minutes of direct sunlight for a skilled nursing population, they actually wheeled them out, had them in direct sunlight for 20 minutes, their sleep improved. Mm -hmm. Their sleep, all of the measures of sleep improved. So, and we think it's because of ultimately melatonin release. So that was a lot of stuff, but I hope you agree. Although we don't have a pill, we don't know how to change the genetics, the other 50% we understand. It's clear that participating in these cognitively stimulating activities is associated with a decreased likelihood of developing dementia. Proper food, physical exercise, resistance training, you know, that's just 10 or 15 pound weights, uh, aerobic training, mindfulness training, good sleep, all of that matters. You put that in and we have the prescription. We have the prescription for better brain health. That's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>